Ooh. I wasn't expecting that. Ooh. Should we go measure it? Hi, it's Todd from Todd's Workshop here, and I'm back with Arrows versus Armour 2 again. Toby Campwell, Augusto Berberont, so our historian and our armourer. Now the purpose of this film is to look at the different materials that armour could have been made from, because there were quite a lot of choices that they could have had in the medieval period. We do know that there was a lot of wrought iron was used, so basically 0% carbon material, and there was even going all the way up to medium carbon steel for higher status individuals, and everything in between. So last time round we used a medium carbon steel and we have to admit that perhaps it was of too high a quality for the ordinary person. We are chasing in these films, we are looking for the information for normal people using normal equipment and yeah perhaps it was a bit too high. You commented, we listened. And so we're looking at what options they had available to them and we're going to compare one with another. So we've got flat plates like this one here mounted in a frame and we're going to put that again on our archery foam targets. And these are all our samples, all 1.5 millimetre thick. So they may resist the arrows or they may not. We're actually not sure. This one here we're going to start with is a charcoal iron, a bloomery iron. So this is 0% carbon. So it is not steel. But then also we have cross laminated wrought irons. We have normal wrought iron, mild steel, high carbon steel. And we're just going to have a look at how these different materials compare one against the other. Just like we do with all our tests. It's a comparison. It's not a piece of armour, we know that because it's flat, but it does allow us to see the difference between one arrow impact and another arrow impact. So Toby, I'd like to hand over to you for some historical context. Yeah, okay, so by the time we get to 1415 at the Battle of Agincourt, uh, wrought iron had been used for plate armour for a while, but increasingly we're seeing medium and higher quality armour being made out of low carbon steel or even medium carbon steel. And there's a whole range of different attempts to, to harden and temper those materials. Although, you know, there's still a lot of technological advancement to come later in that respect. So there's a, a number of historical materials in play, the behavior of which, the protective quality of which we need to better understand. But then there's the other question of how do modern materials fit into all of this as well? Because for a lot of what we're doing, we gotta make, we got to use modern materials. The test armor is modern mild steel. If we're going to do that legitimately, we need to have a good sense of how the protection afforded by mild steel compares to the historical materials. It may not be that different. It might be somewhat different. We don't know. This is now the time we can start to better understand the performance of all these different materials that are all in play and that all will feed into our analysis of the final results. But our armorer, Augusto, can probably tell us more about working with mild steel and why we can actually have a decent amount of confidence in its performance. Sure. So the main difference between modern steels and medieval steels is slag inclusion. Slag is just impurities that act like weak points in the integrity of the steel. Modern mine steel doesn't have any slag, but you can calculate the fracture point of modern steels and medieval steels. And long story short, a modern mild steel does act roughly like a pretty decent quality uh, wrought iron of old. So for our tests, it's good enough of an approximation to use mild steel as an analog for rather average and commonly available material to make armor for a medium wealth knight or men at arms. Uh, these tests have been performed by Alan Williams and they're described in his book The Knight and the Blast Furnace. So he had a whole list of different materials, modern and historical, and he did calculate the fracture point and throughout these uh, comparisons we can be pretty sure that for our intents and purposes the materials behave somewhat similarly. So we know from the work of Alan Williams that the samples should be relatively similar between mild steel and a good quality wrought iron. But we like to find things out ourselves. And we also have other materials as well that we're going to look at. So we're going to take our arrows here and we're going to shoot them at our samples. Now the first thing you need to know is that our sample size is small because it's very difficult to get these materials these days. So we've actually taken the choice that we are going to shoot one arrow 
at each sample. Now that clearly doesn't give a scientific spread of data that you would need for any kind of a, a good study. But what it should do is give us an indicator. It's like all of these things that we do is it gives us a point to talk about, a point of interest, a point of understanding when we look at the other films. The other aspect of this is that these samples are small and I wanna get it fairly central and it's a difficult target for Joe. So we have made a decision to use a longbow simulator, which is this. It is, as you can tell also, a crossbow. However, we've made another film here and go and check it out. It's another arrows versus armor film where I've shot this alongside Joe, same weight arrows. They deliver pretty much the same speed and they behave in the same way. We're all happy that this is a good analog for Joe in this instance, but it has the advantage of being more accurate. We're gonna start with a control shooting into the foam and no steel at all, just to see how deep it goes. Okay. Right, so no metal plates and our control distance is 43. All right, all right. there we go. So let's uh, put the plate on and start shooting. This plate is charcoal iron and that is iron that is from the smelt that doesn't include carbon in it. And it's been sourced from Top & Co, which provide the materials for the restoration of the Royal Palaces here in Britain. It's a good quality, relatively pure iron. It will include slag inclusions uh, and possibly a little bit of flaking, exactly as Augusta was talking about, but it is, or was, an absolute standard for armor for a long time. Good. Nice pretty little wood shaving mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So it's not as central as I'd like, but the thing is this sample is deliberately made, so it's completely supported behind all of it. So it shouldn't really make any difference. And our distance is 14 centimeters. 14. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm. Next. 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 This sample is wrought iron. Now, it comes in lots of different qualities, from very poor to very good quality. But one really good source for good quality wrought iron are medieval bell clappers. So when bells are renovated, the bell clappers can be hundreds of years old. You can never know exactly how old it is, but you do know that it's good quality and you do know that it's old. Wrought iron and bloomery iron are very similar and it's often difficult to tell the difference between the two. But what they both have is a grain structure and that means that it's weaker in one way than another. But that's the nature of wrought iron. Again, it was used for armour for centuries. Good. Okay. So, well, 14. 14 again. Mm -hmm. Which, that, that's good because mm -hmm. it should be the same kind of material as the charcoal iron. Mm -hmm. We can never quite be sure with old raw iron like this how old but it's performing in the same way. So I think the arrow is a bit bent itself, but it's come in at a bit of a slope. Mm -hmm. no. Might have skewed the results a bit, but it's about there. I would say so, yes. This sample is cross laminated bloomery steel. So you can make your smelt in the first place to deliver iron or steel. In this case, steel. So it's got carbon in it, much tougher. Still has striations of slag, just like the other materials. So there is a weakness in one orientation. And just like plywood, you can cross your laminates and you can weld two pieces together that go in opposite directions. You end up with a much tougher material. So it's steel and it's cross laminated. Yes. In there. Mm -hmm. Let's go have a look. Well, it's interesting. So the first thing we can do is measure it. And we have 14. Mm. The other thing that is very notable about that is there's been a material failure here. There's been a tear in from the edge where there is a flaw. Mm -hmm. So I think this one, we just go for a second one and try and get a cleaner shot in this area here. Okay. Right, so a good clean shot that time. There's no breakage, no fracturing around it. So I'm happy. And our distance is well, 13. Mm. Ooh, so in fact, goodness. it's... The failure helped. Yeah. So 
13 centimeters, so it is a bit more resistant than the raw tyre. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So not a great difference, but it has not been heat treated in any way. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Next one up. Next. Just like you can do with the bloomery steel, you can do the same with the wrought iron. So you now laminate two pieces together. You forge weld them together and you end up with the iron equivalent of plywood. It's a much tougher material. So laminated wrought iron. Ah, well, 10 and a half actually. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be better than the laminated steel. But it is. But it is today. So in a way, this result highlights the problem with the sample size of one shot. And that is that we can't trust everything about that number because the material has been processed by hands. It could be a bit thinner there. There might be a pretty nasty slag inclusion at that point. There could be a bit of delaminating of the materials. We just don't know, really. But it is what it is. But overall, the behavior of these historical materials is basically comparable to the mild steel. And that's a key point. Mm. I, I agree with that because it's similar. It's within the spread of the armor that people would have had. The protectiveness is comparable. Yeah, and I think, I think so far we're doing that. But the next test is carbon steel. So it, it would be the higher end of what they could do. And I think we'll probably end up seeing something quite different on the mm -hmm. next shot. Okay. This one is a modern medium carbon steel, just like we used on our breastplate last time. And this would equate to really quite high-end armour, we think. It's going to be tough, we know that, but how tough? Mm. I wasn't expecting that. Mm. Should we go measure it? Well, that's, well, obviously different now because there's some of the head is showing there. Yep. So if we measure up, five and a half centimetres. That's a big difference. It is a big difference, but equally, it has penetrated. It has yeah. penetrated, and yeah. I kind of wasn't expecting it to. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. But, of course, this is not heat treated. This is still, it's annealed. It's, it's as soft as this material goes. Yep. And it's not shaped. It's not shaped. It's, it's still. That is a huge difference, I would say. It's almost mm. half less penetration than all the other materials. Yeah. Mild steel. Let's see how it compares. Mm. And this sample is mild steel. And this is here really for two reasons. One, this is the material that we're using for our armor this time around. So we want to see how it behaves in comparison to other things. But the other side of it is that it's the most popular material that's used for armor these days. And so it allows anybody who's doing any tests to take a benchmark from what we've done and to understand your tests better and how that would fit in with the historical record. Mm. Good. Well, it went in, oh, no denying that. Good. Let's go have a look. Ooh. So, mild steel. So it's a good clean hit. Now, our distance is 10 and a half. Well, that's interesting. So, let's go and conclude. All right. Well, again, fantastically interesting set of results. And well, I'm going to start with you, Toby. So what are you making of what we have here? Well, I'm feeling a lot better about a lot of things now. Until now, we haven't had much of a sense of how the protectiveness of mild steel compares to historical materials that were actually at the Battle of Agincourt. And what we can see now is that basically all of these materials, with the exception of the medium carbon steel, they're all kind of behaving more or less in the same way. The modern mild steel is pretty much behaving exactly the same as the wrought iron, laminated. That's a really important point, that the mild steel is a good analog for historical materials of a kind of medium level of quality. It's better than the cheapest low-grade materials, and it's not as good as the high end, but it's, it's pretty average in a historical context, and that's, that's for us really important. I mean, I'd, I'd agree with that. So, I mean, Augusto, have you got something you'd like to say? Well, again, I am really glad that basically we had the same presentation between the mild steel and the cross-laminated wrought iron, which is 
the most common type of metal you would have on a battlefield at the time. Iron armor was present in sales records and uh, inventories in the late 14th and early 15th century, but it is by far not the most common armor present. It is the cheapest, but the most common one is like steel, not tempered, and that's what you would see on the battlefield in Agincourt. So mm -hmm. I would say mm -hmm. we are right there. So my takeaway from this is Unfortunately, it is a small sample size. You know, there's no getting away from that. But it gives us some confidence that we're looking in the right direction. We're looking for the normal equipment, the normal things that people had. Not the best, not the worst, somewhere in the middle. And this mild steel is behaving somewhere in the middle. And so that's good enough for our tests. You know, that makes me feel good about it all. But the other thing actually, of course, is that this is only possible, these films are only possible because of the Arrows versus Armour 2 fundraiser that we did on Kickstarter. And all you wonderful people out there who donated to it, thank you so much, because this information feeds back and it just educates us all. And that's all we can ask for. We'll never solve everything, we'll never know everything, but we can understand more. And this brings it. So thank you. There are other films to watch. Go watch them. Arrows vs. Armour 2.